everybody. It is uh, great to be here. So I'm going to talk today about uh, the crafts that have been a big part of my life. And um, I guess I'll start by talking about the first craft I really got involved with, because uh, Nathan had asked me, you know, hey, can you come talk about craft? And I thought, like, well, geez, I've done a lot of different things. I wonder what I should talk about. And so I started thinking back, and the, the first craft that I really got involved with um, was with, with these. Yeah, so I had worked as a uh, professional juggler for, uh, for several years, working at uh, amusement parks, working with traveling circuses, had some amazing mentors, learned a lot about stagecraft and showmanship during that. But gradually, my, I kind of shifted my career, and I shifted in kind of a strange way over to software development. And this is a very different craft. You still have to work really hard to get good at it. Um, there's a lot of focus involved, and I worked at places like IBM and Bell Labs. And then I was really lucky, I was able to combine these two. I found an opportunity at Walt Disney Imagineering. And that's when I really got involved with game development. So at that point, I was, I was taking what I knew about stagecraft, what I knew about software development to make virtual reality experiences. And then after that, I kind of used that to transition over to Carnegie Mellon, where I started teaching about game design and game development. And I also opened my own game studio. And that studio has grown over the years. And now we have about 120 people over in Station Square making games of all kinds. And so in that way, I've kind of shifted from being uh, all about hands-on making games. Now, like, leadership ends up being a big part of what I have to do. And I realized these are kind of four very different crafts that I've been involved with. So when they asked me, hey, can you come talk about craft? I'm like, which one am I going to talk about? But then I started thinking more and more, and I realized, you know what? Maybe there are some commonalities between these crafts. And I realized there were, because all of them, what they all really have in common is they are all about the design of experiences. Um, different kinds of experiences. Juggling is all about experiences for the audience. Software is about experiences uh, for the user, user experience. Game design is about player experience. And then leadership, when you're talking about leading big teams, you're really creating experiences that those teams are going to go through. So I thought, you know, hey, that's a little bit of an anchor that I could use to talk about. So I'm going to talk a little bit today. I'm going to give five tips if you're ever designing, creating experiences of any kind that I've found particularly useful. So the first tip has to do with engaging people's imagination. We really, it's important to engage people's imagination. And the right way to do that is almost always through storytelling. People are tempted when they talk about a concept, they're trying to get something important across, they want to speak in generalities, because generalities are big. And, and, and the, the, because general is better than specific, because when you're specific, well, you miss things, and there's cases you don't hit, and, and it, only hits, it only is important for some people, so they tend toward generalities. But that's all wrong and broken, because that's not how the mind works. The mind doesn't think in generalities. The mind thinks in specifics. It wants the, the anchor of a specific story. So to be more specific, let me talk about one of the games we developed at Shell Games, this game called Night Shift. So the idea of this was uh, a doctor had come to us saying that she was trying to, uh, she wanted us to help them make a game that could help train emergency room doctors to be better at what they did, um, to be better at uh, dealing with trauma situations when they showed up in hospitals. And she had tried to make a, a digital training app that would help them, and she found that it really wasn't helping very much. And her theory was it wasn't emotional enough. And she thought maybe a game could be more emotional, and the emotion would help people remember their lessons out of it. 
And so we worked on this. And so we made this game called Night Shift. And it's all about this, this game where you're this doctor who has to move to a new town and working at a new hospital. And there's this whole weird thing with your grandfather. So part of it is like you have to kind of understand this mystery of like what happened to your grandfather before he died. And at the same time, you're working in the hospital actually doing and treating cases. And many of your patients actually know things about your grandfather. And so the whole concept here was by making you actually care about this character and this situation that you might remember the outcomes of the cases a lot better. The problem we had was it wasn't working. And it wasn't working because people didn't like the character. People were like, man, this doctor, he's so grumpy. Like, I just, I don't know, I don't really into this. But we had him grumpy because... The, because he had this unresolved problem, and we were going to reveal that later, but the problem was he was so off-putting in the beginning, nobody could relate to him. So all we did, we made one small change. We put a little flashback sequence at the beginning, which sort of shows the earlier relationship he had with his grandfather, and then his grandfather gradually freezing him out, and how this kind of changes him and turns him into this kind of sour individual. And then people were, like, were really sympathetic, and everything changed. They started really caring about... Um, this character. And it turned out pretty well. Here's Dr. Mohan to talk about it. Boop. Volume up. Volume up. It's like the slider. It's like an up knob of some kind. Maybe. I don't know that. It's coming down the HDMI. It's coming. Uh, I don't it's know, man. The audio. Well, yeah, I mean, is that, yeah, okay. All right, that's cool. We'll just roll with that. We'll just keep going. What she's saying is, it worked really well. <laughs> yeah. No, they were able to show um, specific, uh, imp significant improvements in terms of how much doctors were able to retain from this versus more traditional training. And the theory really is, because the emotional centers of the brain and the training centers of the brain were engaged together, you remember better. Because the emotional part of the brain and the... Um, the emotional part of the brain and the, me and the ugh, memory part of the brain are connected. So when emotional things happen to you, you remember them better. How do you apply that to something like leadership? It's the same way. So for example, I've got some brilliant idea of like, oh my god, I've got this idea about how to use Lewis dot chemistry to better teach chemistry through a game. And I could go to my team and say, check it out, Lewis dot diagrams. What a great way to teach chemistry. We should do this so it's easier for kids to intuitively learn about chemistry. And I could do that, and they could go and do that, but man, that's so general. Much better is if I go and I get way more specific, and I say, hey, I saw this story about this 10-year-old who, because, she'd, because her teacher had worked with her and, and helped her understand these certain ways that Lewis dot diagrams work, she was able to invent a new molecule that no one had created before, and she and her teacher ended up publishing a scientific paper about it. And I've got an idea about how, I can, how we can take this turn it into a game so millions of kids can have this same deep experience. When I have a specific story like that, it's, it's a much stronger way to get people engaged and involved because it engages the imagination. Okay, so the second thing is indirect control, right? The idea is to put people in charge. Now, what is indirect control? It's a weird phrase. But people want to be in charge of things. The best way to in illustrate indirect control has to do with these two. Um, John, John and Yoko, everyone always talks about, you know, all, everything that happened with the Beatles once, once Yoko showed up, but no one ever tells a story about how they met. It's really fascinating. One day someone, a friend of John Lennon's comes to him and says, hey, hey, there's this modern art show downtown. Uh, you want to go? And he's like, ooh, I don't much care for modern art, you know. And, uh, and he's like, no, John, come on, you should go. And so they go and they're looking at this art exhibit, and one of the things that they have there is this interesting exhibit where there's a ladder. And high up above the ladder is this white canvas hanging. And there's this mag magnifying glass on a chain. And you could stand there and you could look at this. It's like, oh, what an interesting piece of art. But of course, that's not what it wants you to do, is it? No. And so it's not what, what John did. What John did instead is he climbed the ladder. And you get to the top of the ladder. And there you are. And there's this canvas. And there's this magnifying glass on this chain. So what do you do? You pick it up. There's a picture here of Yoko actually standing on it, you know, picking it up and looking at it. But the canvas is completely blank. But of course, you've got the magnifying glass, there must be something. So you look, and you look, and you look, and it turns out really, really tiny, there's one thing. 
really, really tiny. There's one word, the word yes, written super, super tiny. And John's standing up there on the rickety ladder, and he finds it. And he says, ooh, I'll have to meet this woman, you know. And that was how uh, John and Yoko met. And the thing about experiences like this is they, you can't put them on video. You can't just talk about them. It's something that is interactive and engaging. And of course, it didn't tell you what to do. It didn't directly say, do this, then do this, then do this. You walk up to it, and you know what to do. It indirectly controls you to do what you want. Um, so here's an example. I want everybody to put their, their eyes in the upper right corner of this screen. Just hold them there. Keep holding them there. Don't move them. Don't move them. Now let them go. All right? So, like, you've had yeah, there's this magnet that pulls your eyes because that's just how it works. That's just how these things work. Walt Disney knew all about this. That's why there's that big castle in Disneyland. He was worried about people getting all clumped up at the front of the park and blocking others from from being able to go where he wanted them to go. So deeper into the park, he puts this really tall castle. And people walk in, they're like, oh, this is really beautiful. Oh, the castle. And they start walking to it. Because where your eyes go, that's where your feet go in an interactive experience. And of course, once you get close to a big thing, it doesn't pull you so hard. So it pulls you hard from far away and less and less as you get close. But then you're in the middle of the park and there's other big, tall things. Ooh, Space Mountain, ooh, Big Thunder Mountain. And then you walk to those. And so just like dipping a paper towel into water and it just sort of wicks up into it, people would wick into the park and go just where Walt wanted. They had total freedom, but they did exactly what he wanted. And that's indirect control, very powerful, something we use in video games a lot. When I'd worked on uh, the, the, my first virtual reality experience at Disney, the Aladdin's Magic Carpet Ride, we had this experience. We wanted people to fly into the castle, fly up to this throne, and the Sultan was going to give you an important message, and then you'd fly away. But the problem is, you got into this big room, people would fly everywhere. They wouldn't go and talk to the Sultan at the throne. They'd just fly all over the place. And we're like, ugh, this stinks. We, we want people to have freedom, but we want them to talk to the Sultan. I guess we're going to have to lock them down, just put them on a rail, and burp, pull them up there. And we were sad about it but we didn't know what else to do. And the art director said, you know, dit, 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 let me try one thing. And so, boop, he put that red line. He just painted a red line on the floor. Changed everything. People came into the room, right up the red line. There's the Sultan. He's like, you got to go save Jasmine. And then they would go off and fly. And you talk to him later, like, what did you do when you got in the big room? Oh, I went and talked to the Sultan. Why? Oh, because he had an important message for me. But they, they, no, that's not right. I'm like, what about the red line? Just said, no, I, there was no red line. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? And that's just when you design experiences well, they control people to do what you want them to do. In terms of leadership, this is important. People expect leaders to have all the solutions. That's how they think of it. Oh, the leader is going to tell us what to do. And you can do that. You can show up and say, I have the answer. Much better is if you could show up and say, you know what? There's a big problem. Let me tell you exactly what the problem is. And let's talk about it together. Because when you do that, then you're getting people involved by clearly defining the problem. Everybody likes to solve problems. Everybody's going to start to step up with solutions. And it may be that everybody working together, they're going to come up with a bunch of solutions. And they're probably going to come up with something better than you showed up with. And then further, when, when it's something everybody comes up with together and says, yeah, 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 this is the right way, then they, they, it means more to them. And it's like Lao Tzu says uh, in, in, the, in the Tao Te Ching, when the best leader's work is done, the people say, we did it ourselves. It's important, it's important. That's all about indirect control. So third one, interest curves. All good experiences build up to some kind of powerful climax. And I learned this when I was first doing juggling shows. I worked for this show troupe that was led by a magician, and he gave us this opportunity, me and my partner. He said, we got an extra slot. If you guys can come up with a 20-minute juggling show, we'll put it in. So we designed this show, and we thought it was really great. We rehearsed the heck out of it. And then we go and we do the show, and it goes okay. And I come off stage and say, you know, what would you think? He's like, well, it was pretty good. What would you think about the audience reaction, he says. And we're like, it was, it was okay. He said, yeah, it was okay. Yeah, I know the problem, he says. The problem is your show is shaped like that. I'm like, um, okay. He says, and what people want is they want a show shaped like that. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're, I don't get this. And, and he's like, what the problem is, you know, in terms of interest over time, when you block this out, what people want is a strong hook at the beginning of the show. And then they want a series of escalating climaxes until you have a really big one at the end. 
And you guys don't have that. You start on kind of a downbeat, then you have a couple cool things, and then a really great thing, and then a thing at the end is not so good. So what I'm going to suggest is you merge the last two things into one bigger thing and flip your first two peaks so you get something more like the new, the, the, the lower curve. And we did this. We did the same act. We just did things in a little bit different order, and the audience reaction was totally, totally different. And this is just the nature of sort of design of everything. And, once, and you start to see this pattern everywhere, this little peak and then three big peaks. Once you start to see it and know it, every movie, the three-act structure, popular songs, you know, the three verses that build in a certain way, storytelling works this way. Almost everything, this thing shows up, the, 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 the rule of three in comedy, like this, this shows up everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Oh, and how is this important for leadership? This is what people want when they have a job. This, I mean, people want, I want promotions over time, I want raises. This is why we have inflation. Infl you ever think about inflation? It's so weird, like, you'd think that things would cost more and then later they'd cost less and they'd cost more and it would go up and down, but it doesn't. It always goes up and up and up and up. It sometimes takes little dips, but then up and up and up again. Why? Because everybody wants raises. I want raises all the time to show how great I am. And eventually, the people giving out the money are like, it's going to make everything cost more. And people say, I don't care. I just want more money. OK, fine. Everything will cost more at the store. And you'll get more money. And that's just human nature. That's why we have inflation the world over. So fourth thing about experience is meaning is super important to people. And meaning is about finding the deep truths in what you're doing and doing everything you can to reinforce them. I worked once on a game all about Hercules. And this is after Disney had made the Hercules movie. And they said, yeah, we want you to make a kind of virtual reality game about it. And we thought, OK, all right, we could, we could work on that. Um, so we started studying the Hercules story. Because it's a weird story, right? It's not like you, you think, oh, it's a story about a strong dude. Easy, we'll make a thing where you do strong dude stuff. And that's what this is. But man, Hercules is a story we've been telling for 3,000 years. When a story is that old, there's probably something more to it. So we started looking closely at it. We looked at all the versions. In some of them, it's the seven labors of Hercules. Some of them, it's the 10 labors. Some of them, it's the 15 labors. So there's a lot of variation, but there were some things that were always the same. One thing that was always the same, um, Hercules doesn't just do, he always does strong stuff, yes, but he also faces difficult choices. In every story, he faces difficult moral choices and he chooses the good but difficult path. And then, always, he ends up defeating death at the end of the story. The end of the story is about him defeating death. So what we realized is what this Hercules story really is, even though it has physical strength on the surface, it's really about moral strength. And the lesson is, if you are morally strong, you can be immortal. And that's not a lightweight message. That's the center of every religion. Um, if you are morally strong, you will become immortal. And that's why this story hangs around. And realizing that, we realized how important it was to make sure that he had this big encounter with death and that, that, was, that there was a big ascension that was part of that. And it really felt like it made the whole experience stronger. And we see this in a lot of things. Look at the movie Titanic. This movie made a billion dollars, a billion with a B, right? And it's a stupid story, right? I mean, when they, it was a joke when they were making it in Hollywood. Like, the joke was like, everyone knows how it's going to end. Who would go, right? Um, but it wasn't, right? Because it was a story about something actually kind of deep and meaningful. What I would argue the, the strong message in Titanic is love is stronger than death, and love is more important than life. And that's heavy stuff that we don't like to touch with our hands. It burns us, so we have to wrap it in stories so that we can hold it. And that's why these truths are deep, and there's meaning, then that works. So how does that work in the realm of leadership? An important thing is mission statements. And everyone's like, oh, mission statements, that's so corporate, that's a bunch of corny garbage. It can be. If you have a totally bogus fake mission that nobody cares about, yeah, it can be fake garbage. But if you actually sit around and think about, well, what, what is our real meaning? Why are we doing this? So our, our mission statement, for example, to create experiences we're proud of with people we like so we can make the world a better place. And that sounds simple, but it's a deep idea. Well, what experiences are we proud of? What, what are the kind of people that we'd like to work with? And what does it mean to make the world a better place? But when you, when you hold everything you do up against a, some, some deep meaning and you do it consistently, 
your work ends up having meaning because people want meaning in what they do. And then the last thing I'll talk about is the idea of magic. And magic is not an easy thing to understand. A lot of people just say, oh, well, magic, that's silly. That's for children. Magic doesn't exist. That's not a real thing. But I found that as I looked over all the interests that I've had in my life, all the things I've spent time looking at and pursuing, it occurred to me that every single one of them is about a kind of magic. And I started realizing, like, wow, magic is something that's very important to me. But what does that even mean? What does magic even mean? And, and the thing that they all have in common is magic is about changing the rules. Magic is about things don't work the way that you thought they did. I love this story about Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein once gets invited, he, you know, he's all famous, and he gets invited by this ladies auxiliary group, like, oh, Dr. Einstein, every year we pick a man of the year, we picked you this year. Could you come and give a, give a talk about your work? And so he says, sure, you know, it's a free meal right in town, right in Princeton. So he, he's, so he, he shows up at this thing, they have the meal, and then you know, the, the, the host gets on stage, and now Professor Einstein's going to talk about his work with special and general relativity. And he gets up and he looks out at his audience of little old ladies who were sitting there, and, and he, he says, you know, I could, I could talk about my work with uh, physics, um, but I was thinking if it was all right with you, instead I, I'd rather play the violin. Would that be all right? And everyone said, oh, well, I, 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 yeah, I guess so. Okay, fine. And so... Albert Einstein spent the hour on stage playing different pieces on the violin, and it was incredibly memorable, and everybody loved it because he knew what they really wanted. They said they wanted to talk about physics, but they didn't. They wanted an intimate encounter with the famous Professor Einstein, and he knew a better way to deliver that than anyone would have ever asked for. And so it created a really magical moment, and that's how magical moments get created. They get created when you break the rules. Um, there's a great uh, statement from uh, Ed Catmull, and he wrote this great book, Creativity Inc., about work at Pixar. And I love this phrase, only leaders can remake the rules. When you're at, when at a company with a group of people working, if people assume that things are the way they are because the leaders want them that way. So that's one of the, the, the key responsibilities of any leadership is to break the rules when it's the right time to break the rules. I had a great example of this. We worked on this game at Shell Games called I Expect You to Die, right? Which is this virtual reality escape room kind of a comedy thing. And we'd been working on it. It was going really well. And I heard people whispering about something, joking about something. I'm like, what is that? They're like, no, 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 no. You don't want to know about that. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And then after it happened three or four times, I said, God, what is this? And they said, oh, we don't want to show you. I'm like, why don't you want to show me? Oh, because you're not going to let us do it. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You know, what is it? Just show me. Oh, all right. And so they show me this song that they'd made. Because this thing is kind of a James Bond theme. And the team had written a song and made a little VR kind of music video for the song, just like the beginning trailer at a James Bond movie, right? I can show you a clip of it here. I don't know if our audio is going to go, but um, uh, you can see some of it visually here. Um, and... Uh, it ended up, you know, it's got this really, it's this really cool song, just very much all about um, how I expect you to die. And it was just, it was super fun. And I'm like, I'm like, guys, this is so good. How can we not do this? They're like, oh, it's not in the budget. And I'm like, but we can change the budget. You know, it's, it's, that's, they're like, really? That's possible? It's possible to change the budget? I'm like, yeah. Oh, oh, Okay. And anyway, and so we ended up with the saying, it ended up doing really well. We, we got a nice award from the Art of the Title people um, for, uh, uh, for creating this kind of interactive title sequence. Anyway, so that's really my last thing here, is that everyone wants to create magical experiences. And the, the, the thing to understand is anyone can create magic. You just have to be willing to break the rules. Thanks very much. <laughs>